Yep. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Herbert, Managing Director of Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies. It's my pleasure to welcome those gathered here today with us at the museum in Washington, DC, as well as those of you watching live on the web uh, for the release of our latest report, America's Rental Housing, Expanding Options for Diverse and Growing Demand. This year's report is the fifth in a biannual series that began a decade ago undertaken with the generous support of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and the Joint Center's Policy Advisory Board. The purpose of the report is twofold. First, to provide a comprehensive, fact-based overview of the state of rental housing markets, to serve as a reference guide for those looking to understand and to document market conditions in this important sector of the housing market and the economy. Second, the report aims to raise awareness and spur public debate about the challenges we face as a nation in needing the need for good quality, affordable rental housing for an increasingly diverse cross-section of the country. Today's gathering is intended to highlight both dimensions of the report. In a few minutes, my colleague John Spader, who managed the development of the report, will present an overview of this year's key findings, highlighting the critical aspects of current market conditions. In short, over the past decade, we've seen a broad-based surge in demand for rental housing that's outpaced our ability to supply housing for all those seeking to rent, all of which has occurred in the context of falling household incomes. Together, these trends have created record numbers of Americans struggling to find housing they can afford. Following the presentation of the report, and in keeping with the goal of spurring a healthy and much-needed debate, we will then have a panel discussion moderated by Emily Badger of the Washington Post to explore the issues the, port, the report raises. Emily will introduce our panelists, but let me just say that we're very thankful to both Emily and the experts who have joined us here today to share their experience and their perspectives. We'll take questions at the end of the panel discussion, both from those of you who are gathered with us here today and via Twitter from those watching from home. You can submit your questions and comment on the report and comment on the discussion uh, using uh, the Twitter hashtag, rental housing. Before returning to the report in the panel, though, I'd like to offer a few words of thanks. First, to the Joint Center staff who have worked extremely diligently to ensure that the report is comprehensive and meticulously accurate. I'm grateful for having such a dedicated and talented team at the Center. Second, I'd like to thank an advisory committee that we put together who volunteered their time to provide invaluable input on both the scope of the report and the content of early drafts. The committee was enormously helpful in ensuring that the report covered important topics and was as balanced as possible. I won't go through the list, but the members of the committee are listed on our website where you'll find the report. We are indebted to them for their important contribution. And finally, I'd like to thank the MacArthur Foundation. Over the last few decades, the foundation has played a critical role in supporting efforts to investigate and document how housing matters for the well-being of individuals families, and communities across the country, and in particular, how good quality, affordable housing matters. We're very thankful to the, for the Foundation's invaluable support, not just for the Joint Center, but more broadly for the significant impact they've had across all of their endeavors in raising awareness and understanding of rental housing issues and in building the capacity of many organizations to address this vital need. We have Miho Vodopich, uh, Miho Vodopich with us today, the Program Officer from the Foundation, to say a few words on behalf of MacArthur. Please join me in welcoming Mio. Good morning. 
My name is Mio Vodapich, a program officer with the John T. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. You know, excited to be here to help launch the latest seminal report on the state of America's rental housing. The MacArthur Foundation has spent more than 15 years and over $300 million across a range of initiatives, issues, and markets, investing in organizations with the simple goal of improving access to decent, stable, affordable housing for low and moderate income families. A vital set of investments the foundation has made since the beginning of its work on affordable, ha on affordable housing has been on research, data, and policy analysis. Our premise was that without current reliable information about market dynamics, policy effectiveness, program accomplishments, decision makers at the local, state, and national level cannot make informed choices about how to direct resources, often resulting in negative consequences for families, communities, and the economy. Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies plays a critical role in ensuring that actionable, dependable information is available to a wide range of stakeholders dedicated to addressing the needs of, unfortunately, a growing segment of the American public. The foundation helped establish the report and is dedicated to seeing its production through 2020. As we will hear shortly in detail, more Americans are finding it difficult to meet their basic need for shelter, and too often having to sacrifice other essential needs, like health and education, all just to cover their housing expenses. This is an exceptionally troubling trend for the world's largest, most dynamic economy, and one that the Joint Center has meticulously detailed. The MacArthur Foundation's goal now in this stage of our housing initiative is to ensure that research and evidence-based practices are driving conversations about how to improve housing policy, and importantly, how to align those policies and integrate them with other social and economic aims. We believe well-conceived housing policy based on evidence can positively affect health and well-being, educational achievement, and the overall life trajectories for the families and individuals we help house. Through support of convenings, conferences, communities of practice, and other communication activities, we hope to lift up best practices <clears throat> and importantly connect disparate conversations among researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. We aim and hope to engage with wor those working in other policy domains to, in order to help broaden the coalition of those who value and champion stable, quality, affordable housing. Now we enter this work with a desire to create a more balanced housing policy, trying to highlight the importance of both rental housing as well as home ownership. We are proud to have played our part in elevating the critical role rental housing plays for families, communities, local economies, and our society. For many years, the MacArthur Foundation has invested both in preserving affordable rental housing in areas of opportunity, but also in communities where investment is sorely needed. The analysis and data in the report we'll hear about today confirms that the lack of affordable housing is truly a national problem. Now more than ever, with this new attention to rental affordability, that attention coupled with rigorous analysis and good data, we believe can lead to a new generation of housing policy, one that addresses the challenges faced by over 20 million Americans who are a housing cost burden in this country. The Joint Center has produced yet another informative, insightful report on the status of rental housing and of renters in the United States. Now please join me in welcoming John Spader, Senior Research Associate at Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies, who will present the key findings from today's report, America's Rental Housing, Expanding Options for a Diverse and Growing Demand. Thank you. Thank you, Mio, for that introduction. I'm gonna spend about the next 30 minutes presenting the key findings um, and from the topics in the report. Um, after that, we'll have about 75 minutes for the panel. Um, for those of you following along at home watching the webcast, we encourage you to join the conversation by Twitter, again using the hashtag rental housing, by submitting comments and feedback, um, as well as your questions. I'm told that, we, um, that your questions may also um, make it into the panel discussion later on today. 
The slides that I'm presenting are visible to those in the room. For those watching on the webcast, they're also available on our website. If you'd like to see those um, or to be able to flip through them on your own, um, they're available from the website with a link just under the webcast, and I'd encourage you to download those as you watch the, the presentation. So I want to repeat Chris Herbert's thanks to Mio and the MacArthur Foundation for their continued support of America's rental housing. I also want to repeat his thanks to the advisory group. In addition, as you might imagine, a report like this can't be completed by one person. It involves a broad team from the Joint Center for Housing Studies, and so I need to say thank you to that, to that team. In particular, Ellen Maria, who's with us today, as well as Marsha Fernald, John Skurchak, and the Harbor Group have been instrumental in making sure that the report is accurate, timely, and perhaps more, most importantly, ready for me to present today. So with that, I'll turn to the findings of the report itself. In 2015, we find the rental housing market in a position where we're experiencing increasing rents, reduced vacancies, and, and surges in construction that are important by historical standards. And so it's an important period to be paying attention to the rental housing market. Between 2005 and 2015, more than between eight and a half and nine million new renters joined the rental housing market. That's upon a base of 34.1 million renters in 2005. We've added eight and a half to nine million renters. That's the largest increase since the Joint Center has begun keeping track uh, of the size of, of the rental housing market. That reaches 42.6 million renter households in 2015. That increase has been accompanied by dramatic reductions in the vacancy rate from a high of 10.6% in 2009 to 7.1% today. For a national vacancy rate to reach 7.1% today, that's the lowest rate in more than 30 years. Rents have been rising along with the reductions in vacancy. We saw a 3.5% real increase in rents in 2015. That's nearly the largest increase since the 1980s. Accompanying that is the fastest pace of multifamily starts since the 1980s, with 96% intended for rental but raising questions about whether or not those additions to the rental housing stock are enough to keep up with historic increases in demand. So in the context of that market, I wanna walk through what we know about the demand factors, the supply factors, rental market conditions, and housing affordability, and how those factors have, have emerged and combined in ways to bring us to where we are today in 2015. So to start, with contributions to rental housing demand. We've seen consistent increases between 2004 and 2015 in the number of rental households, bringing us to the 42.6 million rental households that we see today. Those increases occur during a period when we've seen reductions in the homeownership rate from its peak prior to the foreclosure crisis to where we see it today at about 63% to just below 64%. Certainly that those transitions from ownership to renting have contributed to the increase in the number of renter households, but they're not the only factor that's contributed to those growth. Demographic patterns and the structure of renters across different age cohorts is a second major contributing factor. To better understand that, what we've done is broken apart the increase. We take the eight and a half to nine million new renters and break them into age cohorts to see where we've seen the greatest growth. We're often asked in reports like this what's, what the surprising findings are, and I think this is one that fits in that category. That, if we look, that, that the increases, the largest increases in the renter population are occurring in age cohorts that are occupied by the Gen X population and by baby boomers. Renters between age 50 and 69 saw an increase of, of more than 4 million new renter households between 2005 and 2015. And you can see that we break that out between contributions that are due to increases in the rentership rate and contributions that are due to population growth and other demographic patterns. Among the baby boom age cohorts, it's a relatively even contribution of each of those two factors. If we instead look at the age cohort between 30 and 49, we see an additional 3.1 million renters being added to the rental housing demand. That's because of the smaller size of the Gen X generation that increase is entirely attributable to increases in the rentership rate, both through transitions from ownership to renting as a result of the foreclosure crisis and through delayed home ownership among that group. 
the last finding that deserves being highlighted from this exhibit is that the millennial generation has only increased the number of renters younger than age 30 by less than one million households. If we combine that with increasing rents and reduced vacancy rates, the conclusion we're left with is that there's pent up demand among that generation. When we see slower household formation, it suggests that the millennial generation is waiting to come into the rental population as they age into older age cohorts. One way to examine that is to simply project forward from the demographics that, that we have today, um, holding the homeownership rate constant. When we do that, it suggests that we'll add 4.4 million new renter households by, 20, by 2025, so over the next 10 years. That number will obviously increase if the homeownership rate continues to decline and decrease if the homeownership rate begins to recover, but it gives us a basis for understanding the size of rental housing growth moving forward. The broad base of growth in the number of rental households isn't limited across the, the spectrum of ages. It also spans incomes and household types and a number of other demographics that, that we might also present here. So you can see the broad-based growth across age cohorts. Across incomes, we have a finding that suggests that statistics matter. If we look at growth rates by age cohort, we see the fastest rates of growth among households with incomes of $100,000 or higher. So if we look at growth rates, we see the highest rates of growth among high-income renters. We also see those renters occupying a larger share of the rental housing population, but focusing on those may mask that the majority of new renters are being added among lower incomes. The broad base of rental housing growth is also true across, other, across the other demographic factors that we examine. One of the headlines this morning was that more than half of all renters today are age 40 or older, that the median age of renters has reached 40. Homeownership rates typically increase with age as you move into older cohorts, and they're typically highest among households in their 60s, but even at that age, one in five households rents. And so if there's one conclusion I want to leave you with today, it's not only that we're seeing dramatic growth in the renter population, but that that growth encompasses a diversity of different households with a diversity of needs for different units. So a critical question looking forward, when we see the growth in demand, the question is how has the supply of rental housing responded, and how many new units and what types of units will be added looking forward. So I want to start just with a basic description of the rental housing stock um, because it provides a foundation for the evolution of the stock that, that I'll discuss in a moment. A first finding from our analysis of the stock is just to highlight that the rental housing stock includes a greater diversity of building types than we see among owners. Um, properties that are occupied by homeowners are disproportionately single-family homes. That's perhaps not surprising. It's also true um, that, that the rental housing stock is much more diverse than the homeowner stock. In 2014, 35% of rental units were single-family units. Another 19% were in two- to four-unit buildings. But those figures also challenge the typical image of a rental apartment as being located in a large multifamily building. In 2014, only 17% of all rental units were, in, were located in buildings with 20 or more units in the building. That's true even if we zero in on central cities. In, in census-defined central cities, more than one in four rental units is a single-family home. Almost another one in four units is a unit in a two to four unit building. And so from that base, we can look at the evolution of the housing stock. This is a difficult question to answer with the data that's available, and so what we do is we start with the 2003 American Housing Survey that gives us a representative snapshot of the housing stock in 2003. We then track it forward, we track those same units forward over a decade to the most recent American Housing Survey in 2013 and see how those units have changed, how many units have been newly added to the rental housing stock, and how many we've lost along the way. During the first half of that decade, Tenure conversions provided a primary source of new supply into the rental housing market. Primarily, those are single family units, and during the period of the foreclosure crisis, many of those represent transitions from previously owner occupied units into the rental housing stock. 
In more recent years, we've seen new construction also adding to the supply. The second finding that comes from the data that I'm presenting in this slide is to highlight that those that 10-year conversions and new construction don't add evenly across different affordability levels, but rather primarily add units at, with rents above $800 after adjusting for inflation across those two years. Instead, it's the filtering down of units from higher rents to lower rents that are the primary source of new supply for affordable, uh, of units that are affordable um, at rents below $400 or below $800. Lower cost units are also more sub, are also exit the rental housing stock at increasing frequency, um, and they also have greater incidence of inadequacy issues. So using the HUD defined measures of inadequacy, which captures things like the lack of a complete bathroom, lack of electricity, other major structural features, 9% of housing of all housing units in the United of all rental housing units in the United States didn't meet HUD's standard for being moderately adequate and 3% um, were severely adequate by that definition. We also see challenges in ensuring that, unit, that a sufficient number of accessible units exist to meet the needs of households with disabilities. The most recent figure that we have is from 2011, um, which suggests that seven million renter households include at least one member with a disability. That includes 4.3 million renter households with serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs, yet less than 1% of all rental units have five basic universal design features. Those include things like no step entry, single floor living, and other conditions that aren't sufficient to ensure that the unit is, is, will meet the needs of a disabled adult, but rather they're minimum standards. And so there are clear challenges moving forward in addressing the accessibility of units and other dimensions related to different um, segments of the rental population. So the confluence of those two factors, seeing record-breaking growth in demand along with the supply response leads us to where we are, which is a historically tight rental market. We track two measures of rents. We track two measures of rents. This is gonna happen a couple of times. I'm, I'm using the, the left hand uh, on this one, so bear with me on the slides. Um, we track two measures of rents to, to measure the real increase in rents um, over time. The CPIU measure of rents tracks Rent increases among the full rental housing stock. We saw a 3.5 percentage point increase in rents during a period when inflation went back to zero using that measure. We also track rents of professionally managed departments, which tend to be more responsive to market conditions over shorter terms. Using that measure, we saw a 5.6 percentage point increase in rents among professionally managed departments, with both of those, with both of those rent indexes trending upward. We also see consistent reductions in vacancies. I mentioned that among all rental housing units across the United States, we saw vacancy rates decrease from 10.6% in 2009 to 7.1% today. We also can look at that at a more granular, granular geographic level for individual cities um, using the, the measure for professionally managed departments. When we do that, you see consistent and relatively sizable reductions in vacancy rates in those units. Multifamily starts and completions have come along. Um, in response to that record increase in demand, over the last five years, we've seen consistent um, ramping up of new constructions. So 2015 is currently on track to add 313 completed rental apartments this year um, with, and on track to reach 400,000 rental housing starts or multifamily starts through the end of 2015. The multifamily starts measure in particular is interesting because it's above any level that we've seen since the 1980s. We extend the time frame for this particular statistic to remind ourselves that those levels are not unprecedented. In the mid-1980s, multifamily starts reached approximately 650,000 units in a year, and in the early 1970s, they, they went above one million. And so we see increases and high levels of starts responding to add newly constructed units um, but those levels are not unprecedented. As you might imagine, tight market rental market conditions mean that rental property owners and investors are seeing strong returns, and that is the case consistently across the measures that we track. 
using the commercial property price index for apartments from real capital analytics, we see that the, the property, the pro, pro, rental apartment building prices um, have recovered from their pre-crisis peak. They reached that level in 2013, and they currently have increased to 33% above the pre-crisis peak. Um, and you can compare that with what we observe among single-family homes, which are only recently um, returning to pre-crisis levels. Those increases are accompanied with strong returns on multifamily properties. Um, the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries, um, their data suggests that annual returns on multifamily properties increased to 12% in the third quarter of 2015. That's two to three percentage points above what we've seen in recent years. Net operating income for institutionally owned apartments has also shown steady and consistent increases. Improvement spending on, on rental apartments increased from $50 billion in 2010 to nearly $60 billion in 2014. So across measures, you can see strong returns for owners with improvement spending suggesting that some of that um, growth may be being reinvested in properties. The one measure that gives us some pause is that capitalization rates for investment grade apartment properties declined to just under 5% in mid-2015. So a capitalization rate is net operating income is share of purchase price. So there are a couple of different, that, that measure may point to a couple of different conclusions about whether or not the growth in the rental housing stock um, will continue to increase in the future. But it's the one measure that may suggest um, slowed growth moving forward. Multifamily lending has also grown in tandem with the introduction of newly constructed units. Mortgage Bankers Association data shows us that the outstanding volume of multifamily loans hit $1 trillion in 2015 for the first time. If we instead look at the volume of loan originations, we see steady and consistent increases. The government footprint, so the GSA and FHA share of originations, approximately doubled between 2009 and 2014. Over that same period, the private, private originations increased by more than 600%. So those market conditions raise concerns. In the current moment, what we see is a strong market response to a dramatic increase in demand. But the question moving forward is whether or not that market response will continue and whether or not the increase in supply will both be sufficient to keep up with demand and to produce the variety of units, the, the variety of units that match the needs of individual renter households. At the current moment, the affordability metrics show us the consequences of tight rental markets for individual households' incomes. Median, the median amount spent on housing costs in 2014 was $934 in, in 2014. That's a 7% increase after adjusting for inflation since 2001. Our cost burden measures instead measure total housing costs, so rents including utilities, relative to a household's total income. What we saw in, in 2014 is that the number of renter households spending more than 30% of their income, what I'll call cost burdened, towards um, housing costs, reached 21.3 million cost burden renter households. That's an increase from 14.8 million households in 2001. We can also look at households spending more than half, more than 50% of their income on housing costs. And, and in 2014, that figure reached 11.4 million households, up from 7.5 million households in 2001. It's worth noting that both of those figures are all-time highs. The cost burden share in 2014, so the percent of all renter households um, in 2014 that were cost burdened is 49.3%. That's slightly down from the peak in 2011, um, but well above the rate of 41% that we saw in 2001. And I think a useful breakdown, a, a useful intuition for that, for, for the households most likely to be cost burdened comes when we break cost burdens apart by income category. If we do that, among lowest income households, it becomes clear that cost burdens are almost universal. For households whose total incomes are below $15,000, more than 80% were cost burdened in 2014, more than 70% faced severe cost burdens. The second finding that I need to highlight 
with these figures is that if we instead move up to middle incomes, so for households making between $30,000 and $45,000, and between $45,000 and $75,000 a year, we see the largest increases. In both of those categories, the, the cost burden share increased by about 10 percentage points between 2001 and 2014. Those figures suggest that cost burdens are increasingly becoming common among middle income renter households. There's a geographic component to this as well. Um, and among middle income households, those increases are, are most severe in high cost markets. But if we instead look at, if we look at households with incomes below $15,000 per year, almost universally, more than 80% of renter households with those incomes are cost burdened. Um, if we instead move up to middle income households, um, you can see that they vary from being nearly the same, above 80% in high cost markets, to below 50% in markets like Phoenix, Houston, and Detroit. The consequences The presence of housing cost burdens eating up increasing shares of households' incomes carries real consequences for the well-being of households. So in order to assess this question, we use consumer expenditure survey data um, and focus on households in the bottom expenditure quartile. When, when we do that, it becomes clear that households with severe housing cost burdens, so paying more than 50% of their income towards housing costs, have, only, have on average only $500 left to pay for all other expenditures per month. And we can compare how they allocate those expenditures to households with similar expenditures that don't face housing cost burdens. When we do that, you can see that households facing severe cost burdens spend on average 60% less on transportation. That may some, be somewhat of a mechanical effect as households may trade off higher housing costs for, for locations and lower transportation costs. But it's harder to make a similar argument about things like food expenditures. And so on average, we see that households with severe cost burdens spend 38% less on food, 55% less on health care, and, and for working age renters, 42% less on retirement and pension savings. Those figures raise multiple policy challenges, and I should mention as a caveat, for the sake of time, um, I'm going to move on to the policy challenges and focus my comments here on, on rental assistance. Um, there are clearly a number of other policy challenges that could deserve a, a separate presentation and panel discussion today. In the report, we have a six, section that's devoted to the energy efficiency of the rental housing stock, um, as well um, regulations and barriers to the, the development of new units and to increases in the housing supply also merit discussion. And I expect that the panel um, will engage with those issues um, further. What I'd like to do with my remaining time is simply to provide some basic statistics that provide a snapshot of current funding levels and availability of rental assistance to frame the conversation in the panel. So over the same period that we've seen dramatic growth in the number of rental households, we see stagnant levels of funding for rental assistance. Real funding for HUD's three largest rental assistance programs in, in the 2015 fiscal year remains below its level after adjusting for inflation in the 2008 fiscal year. During that same period, we saw the number of very low income households, households making less than 50% of the area median income, and those eligible for rental assistance, increase from 15.9 million in 2007 to 18.5 million in 2013. A, a second trend that accompanies um, changes in, in rental assistance during that period is a shift towards housing vouchers and LIHTC units as the primary sources of rental assistance. We're touching the largest number of rental units. And these are not, I should say that these are the far, four largest programs, um, and they are not mutually exclusive. So LIHTC units frequently include occupants that are relying on other forms of assistance. Um, but they give some shape to how rental assistance has changed during this period. You can see steady and incremental consistent decreases in the number of public housing units and project-based rental assistance units during a period when we've seen consistent increases in, in housing choice voucher, in the availability of housing choice vouchers, along with the steady introduction uh, of, low in, of LIHTC units as the low-income housing tax credit has supported the introduction of new, new units over time. What I want to leave you with is a snapshot uh, of households that are occupying um, rental assistance units um, using the most recent data that we have. 
89% of units receiving rental assistance are occupied by adults who are elderly, have disabilities, or care for children. I think that it's useful as an endpoint because it brings us back to renter households themselves and to the households that are occupying rental units. These are certainly not the only um, dimensions or, or vulnerable populations that are of interest to federal policy. They're simply the ones that we have data on. It's worth emphasizing that rental assistance also provides critical support in response to homelessness and can provide a platform for deliver delivering integrated services targeting other pop vulnerable populations of interest to federal policy. And so with that, I'd like to conclude, um, and I will turn it over to the panel. So if I can have the panelists go ahead and come up on stage. Um, while they're doing that, I'll introduce the, the moderator. We're extremely lucky to have the panel that we have today. Um, and I'm pleased to, that Emily Badger of the Washington Post has agreed to be with us to moderate the discussion, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. I hope many of you are already familiar with her work. Um, for those of you who are not, I'll just say that the time invested is well worth it to learn from the work that she's done on these issues. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Emily to introduce the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I should, in fact, say that everything that I know about these topics comes from interviewing Chris and other people. So I'm really just a pass-through of information about these topics. Um, but anyway, thank you guys so much for, for joining our panel. We have uh, a fantastic group of people up here who represent both folks who are researching housing, thinking about housing policy, but also some of the people who are actually building housing, uh, both market rate housing, affordable housing, who have promised to reveal all of the secrets of how they actually get those things done. Um, but we've already met Chris Herbert, who's the managing director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. Uh, sitting next to him is Ellen Seidman, who's a senior fellow at the Urban Institute, where uh, she focuses in particular on issues having to do with housing finance and community development. Sitting next to her is Paul Rodan, who has joined us all the way from Chicago, where he's the CEO of the Hispanic Housing Development Corporation and where he has been involved in actually developing a lot of affordable housing. And then at the far end, we have Toby Bazzuto, who's the president and CEO of the Bazzuto Group, which has developed thousands of units of uh, market rate, mostly rental uh, housing, you know, in, including in particular in the Washington, D.C. area. A lot of the buildings that you see going up in Washington, Toby is personally responsible for putting them there. So I, I wanted to start by talking about um, who these renters are, who we're talking about. You know, when, when we're describing a historic rise in the number of renters in America, what I'm particularly struck by is the fact that, you know, we're, we are not just talking about 20-somethings, single people, low and moderate income renters. I mean, one of the takeaways of this report is that the rise in renters is being driven by every single demographic you can think of. You know, it's not just single people, it's also families. It's not just moderate income people, it's also people making more than $100,000 a year. And, um, you know, I, I think that this fundamentally sort of challenges a lot of the stereotypes that we have about who renters are. And uh, Toby, I think that, you know, you're, you're particularly well positioned because you're responding to demand. Uh, to, to tell us a little bit about whether or not the, the demand that you're seeing looks different now from what it looked like in the past. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, the demand we, we've seen, let's call it in the past five to seven years, is markedly different than, than that we saw before 2008. Uh, my company specializes in mostly high-end rental housing, although I'm very privileged and blessed that we do one or two affordable projects a year. But I'll speak mostly to the market rate side of the business, as the other panelists can more than speak for their side. Um, what we've seen is, if you, if you look at these demographic charts, you have a huge millennial boom. You have a baby boom on the other side as a bookend, and in between Gen X and Gen Y. All of these divisions, for different reasons, are renting versus owning in disproportionate numbers than we've seen before, perhaps mostly attributable to the credit collapse of 2008. So with lack of credit availability and, and the bloom was off the rose, if you will, about for sale housing, more and more people are viewing renting as a choice. Now again, I'm only speaking to this higher end, so forgive me. There are certainly people that see renting from a different perspective, which is that of need versus choice. So long story short, we're seeing millennials come in droves. We're seeing Gen Y and Gen X delaying household formations till their early 30s, which is another trend that we're seeing. 
And then we're seeing some baby boomers return to the cities, which is mostly where we built. Mm -hmm. the, you, you mentioned that's what's going on at the top of the market, but some very different things are happening at the bottom. And you know, I think that's another very big takeaway of this report. We're talking about two very different stories of what your experience of the rental market is. If you have a lot of money, you have a lot of options, a lot of stuff is being built for you, or if you're at the bottom and increasingly you know, your, your housing burden is getting worse and worse and affecting sort of your ability to spend money on other things. Um, Paul, you, you are working more in Chicago with people who are dealing with that sort of other side of this story. Uh, do, do you see that you know, people who have had a hard time finding affordable housing are having a harder time? I mean, how, how, much, do, how much do you feel and witness in Chicago the, the pinch that's happening on, on people who are closer to the bottom of the income spectrum? Uh, it's enormous, uh, especially because Chicago is a city that uh, increasingly is, uh, has a substantial portion of it being gentrified. There's a lot of bad things going on in Chicago, but there's a hell of a lot of good things going on as well. Uh, you know, there's a, about a, a mile and a half, square mile section of downtown Chicago where the population has doubled over the last 10 years and extremely more affluent than the rest of the city. And so that has an impact on what were working class neighborhoods 10, 15 years ago rents going up, uh, income staying the same, you know, people trying to grow their families, and uh, you know, it's increasingly a challenge to find housing that's, that meets your family's needs and meets your, your pocketbook as well. One good example of that is that we last year finished building, it was an elderly building, we've had the same situation with family projects as well, 72 unit apartment building, we had 900 applicants for those apartments. Every time we do a project, more people hate us than like us. It's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Ellen, who are, who are you worried about? I mean, I think there's reasons to be worried about a lot of people, not just the people on the bottom, because we've also talked about, you know, cost burdens are starting to creep up the, the income spectrum. You know, even people who think that they make a fairly decent amount of money are still having a hard time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, in your mind, where, where should we be focusing our attention? Who should we be worrying about here? Well, I think the, the moral of the story of the report is we ought to be worried about everybody. Yeah. Um, but um, I think there are two groups that I want to highlight that, that we sometimes don't focus on. Um, one is families. And um, you saw from the report that um, uh, adults with children are one of the groups that, that are um, increasingly in rentals. Now, there are multiple stories here which are kind of interesting. Uh, one is that in, in some way, they may be having new opportunities. So people who um, formerly might have wanted to buy but not been able to buy may now have an opportunity to rent a single family house in a location that may give them access to good schools and other amenities that formerly would have been difficult to get on the rental market. Um, that could be good, but one of the things we don't know is what's going to happen to those single family rentals. How long are they going to stay in the single family rental stock because their presence in the rental stock depends not only, of course, on the renter, but also on the landlord. And while many of those landlords are and always have been people who owned one, two, three properties, we also know that in certain markets, um, a lot of those, uh, those homes are owned by institutional investors. And we're going to have to wait and see exactly what their long-term intentions are. So um, that, that is one positive potential perspective with respect to families. I'd say a significant negative uh, potential with respect to families is the um, continuing filtering out of the stock of two to four family homes, particularly in older cities. And um, for a lot of reasons, we're not building any more of those. Um, if land costs a lot of money, putting only two units on when you could put five or 10 um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to somebody who's developing. A lot of those buildings are owned by people who um, are um, who um, are not professionals and are strapped for reserves, and therefore you get um, deterioration. 
And yet, um, you know, one of the statistics in the report is in central cities, 50% um, of the affordable stock is in one to fours. So the family situation is something I, I am quite worried about. I'm also worried about the older uh, Americans. And actually, Chris is a real expert on that. So I'm going to hold off there, except uh, other than to say that the housing cost burdens of older Americans, both owners and renters, um, are uh, bad and only going to get worse. And um, under the, uh, we're, we're just not thinking about how to respond to those. And even older Americans who are living in um, places where they're not housing cost burdens may well be living in the wrong kind of housing, housing that's actually uh, detrimental to their health. Chris, so Ellen brought up single family homes, which I think touches on uh, another stereotype that we have about the rental market. You know, not only do we think it's young single people, for the most part, living in it, but we primarily associate the rental market with apartment buildings in the city. And I think this, you know, the, this growing diversity of who wants to rent raises the issue that, you know, we're going to need to start talking about different kinds of housing in the supply. And uh, you know, I, I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about you know what that should look like, how that should change, you know, what it means when we're not just talking about needing one bedrooms and in particular locations. Yeah, I think the fact that we're having renters across the age spectrum, families and older households, uh, really reflects the fact that we tend to think about not just apartments but apartments in the city. But people live in suburbs who want to rent, and as Ellen pointed out, you know, families with children may want to live in suburbs both for their open spaces, for their schools, and the like. And so. I think we do have to think about um, how do we have a broader range of housing available. Um, and I think that the, it's very difficult. You do get into these trade-offs. So, you know, we're going to help the elderly. We're going to help families with children. And I'd like to think about this as a way of, if you think about a broad range of housing that can serve multiple uh, demographic groups. So for example, if we think about suburban areas and say, you know, as, as households age, some of them will be renters already, but many of them are in single family homes. They may be well suited to move into apartments, into smaller housing units, denser housing, close to the suburban centers. Mm -hmm. That same housing would work well for, for millennials and other young households trying to get started. So I think we need to think about a diversity of housing types and a diversity of locations, all of which I think will help people at each, each part of the, of the housing spectrum. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to come back in a little bit to talking about the existing housing supply, which Ellen touched on because the vast majority of our housing is housing that's been here for quite a while. But I, I think one of the trends that a lot of people are, are picking up on if you're not a housing policy person, if you don't research housing, but you just happen to walk through a city like Washington, is the fact that the new supply that's being built overwhelmingly looks like new housing that's being built for people at the very high end. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some of the data in the report really points to the fact that there's a, a very stark mismatch between uh, you know, the, the income makeup of the entire sort of renter community and the income that you would need to rent the type of new housing that's being built. So since we have Toby here and he develops a lot of the market rate housing that I'm talking about, in, including particularly in Washington, um, you know, I, I thought this is, this is like my great opportunity to ask the question I wonder as I bike to work every day past these buildings, which is, you know, why is so much of the new housing that's being developed, the new apartments that are being developed, why are they targeted at the high end of the market? Why, why doesn't the new housing that gets built more accurately sort of match what I think the demand is? Yeah, I, I think you've cued in on a very real and obvious problem. It's almost a tragedy in that only very high income earners can live in cities for the most part, which unfortunately is where the jobs are. So as you get further out the continuum of affordability, people are commuting hour, hour and a half to get to their jobs in the city. So we build market rate housing, as we mentioned. And the reason why everything we and our competitors do is so expensive is that a two by four does not care whether it's in a high rise or in an affordable building. It's the same cost. Labor, same way. So materials labor, land price, et cetera, local regulations. All these things pile on. And when you go to build a building, should you choose to build a building where I like to build, which is near jobs, right? That's my driver. The costs are so high that to get a, an economic return that is financeable, 
rents have to be at the top end of the spectrum. And unfortunately, the more people that do this, the, and we've seen a rush of capital into cities like DC, Boston, uh, San Francisco, et cetera, Chicago, rents go higher and higher because the returns investors are willing to accept get lower and lower. So what's happening is land prices are up. Uh, rents have been relatively flat, but now they're, now they're being pushed back up. So bottom line, the costs to do housing today are prohibitive to build affordable housing without significant government influence. And you'll hear from the experts here that there's a, there's a paucity of funds available to get the affordable housing needed in the country. Well, I, so I want to drill down a little bit of what some of those drivers are that I think are invisible to people. Because you know most of us are thinking, well, there's the cost of labor, there's the cost of materials, and there's the cost of the land. But in fact, uh, there are a lot of regulations that exist today that you have to contend with, whether it's a requirement to build parking that your tenants don't actually want to use because they don't own cars, um, you know, whether it's forces that are influencing the shape of the building that you can make because we have a height restriction in Washington. Uh, how much do the, those other factors having to do with, you know, the mysterious ways that we regulate land use and that, you know, communities restrict what they want built in their neighborhood, how much does that contribute to the, the rising costs of, of building the type of apartments we're talking about? Sure. sure. It, you're on the spot here, too. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the spotlight. Um, it, it influences it tremendously. If I was a cynical person, which I'm not, I would sit here and could pick apart each particular regulation or jurisdiction, but I don't see the world like that. I see it as this is just part of what we do. It's part of building housing. Um, unfortunately, when a developer takes a tax break or gets a zoning variance and it comes with um, political... The, the, local politics play into it, other layers of things are put on. So for example, if I was to take a tax break, I might be mandated to use woman-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses. All of these things are great things in, in their own right. When you add, and I don't mind all of these things even in aggregate, but the net effect is it's increased the cost of building our projects. So interestingly, as, corporates, as community citizens, we're trying our best to solve social issues and increase a stock, the affordable housing stock, but all of these things added in aggregate actually create a problem, a, a deeper problem. If I may add one more point, we own a construction company, and I asked, in preparation for this panel, I asked my guys, you know, how much have we seen construction pricing going up, and we can talk about that later, but they said, interestingly, affordable, pro affordable housing projects uh, are more expensive to build for the same thing, the same unit in an affordable housing project, and I, I asked why, and labor is so constrained that subcontractors are choosing to work, at, take the path of least resistance, the place with the least regulations, the most expedient way to make an, in, an income versus working with wage scales at affordable housing projects or regulations. So unfortunately, it's all in this soup of what makes our business very difficult to provide affordable housing realistically. Can I ask Toby a question? Yeah, <laughs> please. So Toby, one thing we hear about is the fact that it takes so long to get entitlements, and that you know, time is money. And so I'm just curious, when you, you know, have your eye on a place you want to put in an apartment, how long does it take you from the time you start that process until you get the green light to actually get those workers on the site? Usually two years, and in some cases in D.C. it can be. We, we worked on a project in, on Wisconsin Avenue in northwest D.C. that a previous developer worked on for 10 years. Wow. And has that changed over time? Or it's it become harder, be although we see that as a competitive advantage. We, we like the fact that the barriers of entry are difficult in a for-profit <laughs> business that we, we don't mind. It's, it's as economists, patient. I'll tell you that's a problem, to have those barriers to entry. Yeah, well, putting, you know, if you, if you turn the, the model onto how do we get affordable housing built, um, so you're not just solving for your own personal profit-driven reasons, but more social reasons, it's tremendously difficult. Uh, we've partnered with some some of the people in this audience to provide afford very well needed affordable housing, and the jurisdictional processes have been so long that the cost to do so is just extraordinary, and and it becomes a huge burden on a developer and candidly on the nonprofit we've we've partnered with. Chris, I want to turn the same question on you since you don't have the same limitations that Toby has of wanting to 
play nice with regulators and neighbors and communities that you want to go into. Uh, because this is a particular policy problem that you hone in on in the paper itself, that uh, you know, regulation has made it very difficult for us to build these things. And, and in a sense, you know, I, I think oftentimes we want to blame developers and say developers are just building what they want to build because they're greedy and they're trying to make as much profit as possible. And we're not, in a sense, sort of turning the spotlight on ourselves and, and being honest with ourselves about how we have made the landscape very difficult. Mm -hmm. How much of a problem do you think it is? And um, would you like to uh, also be critical of NIMBYs? Um, <laughs> uh, so this, is this an opportunity to not be a nice guy, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Um, I think it is a big issue, you know, and I, I will say that it's hard to quantify, um, but I think that uh, all signs, you know, conversations with Toby, when he's saying it takes two years, uh, and so from two years, you have to have, you know, land tied up, you have to have, you know, paying architects, you're paying other folks, and so that's a lot of time that you're going to be having costs out there that you have to finance. Um, I think it does come down in part to the kind of land use system we have in this country where you have small jurisdictions usually who are responsible for what gets built where they are, and they have a lot of incentives to say, let's keep out that more affordable housing because the tax revenue it's going to produce, property taxes, isn't going to pay for the schools and other services. So I mean, I think it does elevate in some ways up to the state level then, too, to think about ways in which we can bear that burden more fairly. Mm -hmm. um, so and I, another thing I think it's striking is, you know, I was asked a question of, you know, I go back in time, we talk about the fact that 1960, the levels of cost burdens about half they were now, mm -hmm. and they've been marching up over time. And, and why is that? And I think. Part of it is that with every building cycle, I think what we see is that there's another wave of jurisdictions who uh, see high levels of buildings and put the clamps on uh, how hard it is to build. So I think that you know, if we look at New Hampshire as an example, we're looking at building statistics in New Hampshire. John showed that chart. We showed the number of multifamily starts in the 80s was way much higher than it has been over the last decade. Over the last you know, 10 years, we've seen rental housing demand go up significantly. You look at New Hampshire, you're not seeing that building response. So I was asking a, a builder in New Hampshire, I said, why is that? He said, well, back in the 80s, all these, these jurisdictions in New Hampshire didn't really have those kind of rent, land use controls. Development came in, boom, they have all put land use controls in much more restrictively. They didn't have that increase in demand. Now that increase in demand is hitting this much more restrictive building environment. And so each time we go through a building cycle, I think that ability to respond is much higher. And it goes back to, as you said, NIMBYism. I mean, I think part of it is that people want, don't want to see change, period. We're seeing that in cities now, you know, that places like New York and Boston are trying to upzone, trying to respond to this by saying we need to add a housing. And we think of NIMBYism as a suburban phenomenon, but you ask anybody in parts of Brooklyn and other places in, in New York where they're seeing they want the density to go way up, and those communities are also are reacting to it. So it's, a, it's an aversion to change. It's an aversion to um, all the costs that come with that. And I think we have to find a way more broadly to share those costs and, you know, and, and power that kind of development. Mm -hmm. so, Paul, I want to bring you into this conversation a little bit because you know, on, on the one hand, we're talking about how it's become harder, more expensive, more time consuming to build market rate housing. But you know, oh, by the way, it's also become harder and more complicated and more expensive to build affordable housing also. You know, because we don't have the public support for it that we used to. If you're building it, you're constructing some kind of elaborate puzzle with lots of different tax credits and different s subsidy streams. Uh, in, in your experience, because you've been doing this for a very long time in Chicago, you know, how, how hard is it now for, for you to get a project off the ground? And, and what is involved sort of from, you know, from, from day one to actually having people be able to move in? Uh, for us, we were talking earlier, that for us, it's getting harder. Of course, it's getting harder for everybody in the country. Uh, you know, for us, the gestation period for a project uh, is about three years before we start to build it. It takes another year to build, so four years before anybody moves in. Uh, increasingly, uh, you know, the challenge is that the low-income housing tax credit, which is a primary source of capital to put up an apartment building, doesn't do it alone. You need other sources to sort of su supplement that. Home used to be one of those sources, has virtually disappeared. Uh, we have housing trust funds around the country that also help with that in Chicago, or I should say in Illinois. Uh, that's also uh, gone for us because we have a, you know, a really profound economic problem. Uh, but but real, the, the real challenge is in course. You know, I mean, it was funny, as you were talking, I was thinking about a story. There was a guy named Willie Sutton who was a bank <laughs> robber in the 60s and 70s. He's a very successful for about 10 years. They finally caught the guy. And they asked him, you know, why do you want banks? And he said, well, that's because the, that's where the money is. And in a sense, 
you know, market rate developers build where they build because that's where the money is. And for us, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of violating this developer's axiom of uh, minimizing risk, maximizing capital, where we're taking substantial risk, putting a lot of money out there for a long time with the hope that very often we can persuade the community you know, that this housing is really for their children, for their, for their grandchildren, for, you know, the cop on, you know, on the beat, for the nurse that's at, you know, at the hospital, you know, for people who are... And I think that's part of the problem. It's really not a matter of semantics. It's a matter of, uh, you know, we need to have, uh, you know, some sort of marketing effort to talk about what affordable housing really is. When we used to have Section 8 housing, it became something terrible. You know, for most communities, it, it, it was a fear that you were bringing gains, guns, and drugs to that block tomorrow, you know. And so we changed it to affordable housing, then workforce housing. Point is, I think we have a challenge in getting the world to understand that this is a very important, a valuable resource for families making their way through our society as, as they evolve economically, and for elderly people as well. One of the important statistics in this report, for me, was a shock, was that the most severely cost-burdened uh, demographic in this country are people 75 and older. This is a group that got clobbered when the downturn right. happened, and they had their pensions on Wall Street and all of that, and, you know, their houses were paid, but it was worth, they were worth less half than, than what they thought they were. So for us, the challenge is the economics, and certainly one of those problems with economics is Davis bacon. This has nothing to do with breakfast. <laughs> it's not. It's a, it's a huge problem because Davis bacon requires that we, that are building affordable housing, housing have a competitive disadvantage to market rate builders. We have people in Chicago who are building apartment buildings, 20 unit apartment buildings in neighborhoods, who are paying folks $25 and $30 an hour. Davis Bacon requires that we pay a common laborer about 55 bucks, another 12 for fringe benefits, and all, you know, the fact is that the cost of an apartment building, about 72% of it is in construction, and of that number, probably, you know, 50, 60% are in labor. And, and so that's a, an, an enormous component. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I earlier mentioned that the Secretary of HUD, in a crisis, has the right to waive Davis Bacon. Well, I think we're in a crisis. Uh, whether that happens or not will depend on, uh, you know, uh, fortitude here in Washington and whether unions have their way. But the point is that I think this could be, this could be uh, you know, a way of finding literally billions of dollars a year by allowing affordable housing developments to have market rate compensation for those who are building the, the, the projects. Mm -hmm. So, well, I, w I want to come back also to some very sort of specific policy ideas that might help solve some of the problems that we're talking about. But you know, b before we get to that, I mean, there's there is a larger problem, which is that quite quite literally, Ellen, we're just not throwing a lot of money at affordable housing at the federal level to the point where you know. It's, it's about one in four households who should qualify for some kind of housing assistance who ever actually get it because we just don't provide enough of it to meet the need. And you know, one of the particularly remarkable things about the housing problem is that you know, other forms of assistance and benefits that we provide to people in times of need contract and expand mm -hmm. depending on the need. You know, when more people need food stamps, we create more money for more people to have food stamps. You know, when we need to extend unemployment, we've done that. Housing is not an example of something that, of, 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 a, of a sector that responds in any way in Washington to growing need. Why is that? I mean, I'm, I'm not asking you that because I think it's your fault that, that Washington, you know, Washington didn't realize, oh boy, a lot more people are struggling thanks to the recession. But, but you know, if, if we recognize that, you know, that other kinds of benefits need to respond to times of growing need, why doesn't that happen with housing? Well, you know, an interesting thing is that actually in Washington, we do. It's just that we do it in the wrong place. So the um, mortgage interest deduction, mm -hmm. for example, expands. Um, the benefit of not having to declare capital gains when you sell your house expands. What we've got is we've got a system where the housing benefits that run in favor of home ownership for people who are of relatively high net worth um, behave as an entitlement and expand 
as the need, I guess, with air quotes, um, expands. Whereas um, the, the subsidies that we provide for lower income people are on budget. And, um, you know, housing is the, the sort of missing element in every political campaign. It's really quite amazing. Um, you know, you, 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 many, even when domestic issues are being talked about a lot, housing is not talked about. And it certainly is not talked about in a way that, that um, focuses in on the needs of uh, lower income Americans for rental housing. Now, there are some structural issues also. Um, you can um, turn, on food stamp, turn food stamps on and off a good deal more easily than you can build new housing. Um, you know, you've got a long lag time. One of the issues that I know that people are beginning to think about in Washington is, are we going to end up in an overbuilt situation? Um, and these long lead times only make that worse. So, so there's some structural reasons why it's hard. The other structural reason that, that makes it hard is once somebody has housing assistance, it becomes extraordinary. I mean, the rules of the game, in addition to just the rules of possession, um, make it very difficult to move somebody off of um, that assistance. Uh, you know, public housing was originally built to be transitional. And um, it hasn't been transitional for many, many, many years. So I think there are a lot of reasons, but I think it really is important to remember that, um, yeah, we got housing entitlements. They're just in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So I, I was going to ease us into the mortgage interest deduction <laughs> a little bit later. But since Ellen already went there, crazy hypothetical situation, we decide to make that investment in a totally different place, never mind how we get Congress to agree to do that. Right. Paul, what are we spending that money on? What should we spend that money on? Mm. Jeez, you caught me off guard. I've never <laughs> thought for the last 20 years that there'd be more money. Uh, uh, what, would be a, what would be a better use of money that we spend helping people with housing if we were directing it towards the people who really need the help? Yeah, well, uh, you know, one area is, uh, you know, families and growing families, of both black and brown, have a huge demographic children, all of that. And one of the ironic good things about this downturn in 2007, 2008 was, uh, and the 8 million foreclosed homes that were in, in part the result of that was, you know, that the tax credit program until that point building for families were, for the most part, building one-bedroom apartments. On the average, one-bedroom apartments. I mean, those units in some large cities were costing us $325,000 a unit. In Chicago, there were neighborhoods, working-class neighborhoods, where homes were selling, you know, a bungalow for $250,000. All of a sudden, you can, you know, they, you can buy them for $80,000. And you know what? They were four-bedroom, two-bath apartments. They fit a family very nicely. And so all of this came on a market in a way where uh, you know you can go out, acquire it, assemble it, and what we've done, we were involved in a number of foreclosure programs. We still are, actually. We haven't sold any of those homes. We've been renting them out, waiting for the world to come back, for the country, and for these families to sort of wind up selling those houses back. So that's one area that's very, very important. The other area is sort of obvious: is the you know the 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 eight older baby boom demographic. But those people that got clobbered, as you know, we were talking before earlier, in both the stock market and, and in their environment with their homes, who found themselves you know, without very much capital left in their twilight years, uh, you know, trying to find a way to live in a place where you know, they can live with dignity and grace and you know, not have to worry about what they're going to eat next. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important place to put it. I, I think the voucher program is a very important one if it's run well. And, and there's an element of placing people in the right places. And by the way, that includes working class neighborhoods, not only these, these so-called areas of opportunity. I'm really concerned about that concept. I won't, I won't go there. But I mean, we've developed 54 projects in the time I've been at this organization. 40 of those were developments that were built in neighborhoods, which today wouldn't be considered areas of opportunity, but which have thrived as those neighborhoods have come back. About 72, 74% of our people are working, 
people. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, we have to watch that concept. Toby, so you, you are thinking about this demographic also because you do do some affordable projects yes. and, and you also think about inclusionary zoning. Uh, while I'm doling out this mortgage money, uh, do, you, do you need some of it? What would you, <laughs> how, 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 how do you think that we may be able to sort of, you know, restructure the way we make investments in housing as a public sure. in order to, to help out the people who are, you know, having a very different story at the bottom of the market from a lot of the people you're building for? Well, as you heard from Paul, in a wonderful Brooklyn accent, I might add, um, <laughs> albeit Chicago-based, right? Exactly. Uh, there are many arrows that you could throw at this thing to, to fix problems. And I'm sure if you asked all of us, we'd give you different answers. But I'll, I'll give you a more macro answer, which is that when a group like mine or other affordable housing developers go to develop a project, the costs are so expensive that the subsidies we need are increasingly larger and we're confronted with two negative things. One, there's a huge, a larger demand than we could ever serve with the limited funds that are available. So via some program, whether it's vouchers or an increase in the LIHTC program or the home funds that you referred to before, which have been cut, mm -hmm. mostly cut, from what I understand, mm -hmm. um, by injecting these or other sources then you're enabling a developer, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, to actually finance a project. It's as simple as that. It's not that we don't want to do these things, it's mm -hmm. that we can't. For my company to compete for an afford, to get low-income housing tax credits, you, you enter a competitive round, as you know. For my company to do that, we have to make the decision to enter a competitive process, i.e. a lottery, a, a lottery based on a lot of wisdom, but nonetheless a lottery, and the more finite the prize is, the harder it is to do it. Jurisdictional um, requirements say you have to spend all this money to get to apply for these LIHTC uh, credits. So we may be out a million dollars hoping to win a deal. Or we could take that same million dollars and put it for, towards a market rate transaction. So let's say we go through all these steps, we win the deal, life is good, and then we find out, lo and behold, the uses far outweigh the sources available. So I guess I keep coming back to the fact that we need more sources or more subsidies to encourage what is becoming a, a, an epidemic of a, a lack of affordable housing mm -hmm. in this country. Right. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think there's some there's some other implications here. Um, one is you asked the question earlier about um, about land use restrictions and all of those, um, you know, we do need to tackle them. We shouldn't just keep assuming that we should make the subsidy bigger and bigger mm -hmm. to deal with the, the um, restrictions. Having said that, um, to the extent that we can um, mix incomes and put uh, affordable units into buildings that also have market rate um, housing, I, the, uh, the, the economics that say if you build 100 units, it doesn't cost you 100 times more than building one unit, definitely will benefit the affordable housing piece of it. Um, and the other thing is, I was just looking at, at um, a presentation that one of my colleagues did a couple of weeks ago about, expire, about, about um, affordable housing, subsidized affordable housing, LIHTC and others at risk. And for example, in the District of Columbia, um, we have about 40,000 units of affordable housing that is at risk from, aspiring, uh, from expiring subsidies. Half of them are across the river. Um, now, some of those will stay in the affordable pool because the market demand is not caught up to them yet, but a lot of them, even across the river, will be subject to pressures to turn them into market rate housing maintaining them as affordable housing is cheaper than building new. And um, we really do have to focus on re retention of the existing stock as well as the new stock. And my point about two to fours earlier mm -hmm. comes into that. There's a sort of um, off-ramp piece here with, for the seniors that, that's also really important, the question of building accessory apartments and other things that 
build on the existing stock and don't necessarily require um, construction from scratch? Mm -hmm. A couple of observations. One is off of, on this point, I think, um, if you think about the tax code as a way to incentivize property owners to invest not only in new housing but existing housing, it can be a very powerful tool. And so if we think about where the low-income housing tax credit came from in the 1986 Tax Act, prior to that, in the 1981 Tax Act, we created very uh, generous, overly generous, but very generous depreciation schedules that led to that big multifamily boom that we had. Mm -hmm. um, now, we, we were probably not building housing that was economic, but I think it goes to the point, and the tax credit was taken to replace that in part and make it more targeted, but we can have the tax code to incentivize and, and encourage investment both in new housing and existing housing. Ellen mentioned earlier two to fours, other smaller, older housing, that's so important. And what we find is that those are more likely to fall out of the stock because of the fact that the rents they're generating aren't sufficient to maintain them. So how do we use it? Because they have an important public purpose in providing that infrastructure of affordable rental housing, how can we use the tax code wisely to make that happen? Mm -hmm. The other point I would say is, you know, Ellen talked, we talked about the earlier conversation about food stamps and entitlement issues. Um, there was an interesting piece done as part of the Bipartisan Policy Center a few years ago, their housing tax force. They said, well, what would it cost if we actually made the housing voucher program an entitlement for people who are extremely low income, so less than 30% of area median income? The analysis that was done made some assumptions about how many people would take it up, and I believe the answer they came to was about $20 billion. Now, that's a big number to some extent, but it's not big relative to the mortgage interest deduction. And I think it means that it's within our capability. So the answer is, people might say, is the reason we don't have it be an entitlement is because it's too expensive. Rock. But I don't think it is too expensive if you look particularly at the benefits it has. Mm -hmm. um, Raj Chetty's work and uh, Nathan Hendred at Harvard have looked at the, uh, the impact of people from the MTO, the Movement to Opportunity Experiment, people, what their impact on their lifetime earnings is of having stable and secure housing. We can debate about place based or the like, but basically people who get stable and secure housing and places of opportunity make more over their lifetime and pay back in taxes what it costs for that housing. So I think we can be short-sighted in terms of short-term expenses versus long-term gains. Um, but I do think that if we're gonna make that investment, what we wanna make sure is that assistance is, as we say, a platform for opportunity. And how do we use that period of stability and security in a person's life to help them get to that next level and not have this kind of the faces cut off when my income grows, I'm gonna lose everything. So we have to make sure that the assistance programs provide an incentive and encourage and support mm -hmm. to move up the ladder and then free up those subsidies for the next people who need it. Two things that I would add to that. One is that uh, they're in existing affordable housing. There could be enormous savings achieved with energy conservation. We started a, 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 a affordable housing oriented ESCO, energy services company about three years ago. We did about 1,200 of our own units as an experiment, and through using photovoltaic, geothermal, and others, and, and sealing up a building well, we were able to save 35% of energy costs. 35% over 10, 12 years becomes a lot of money, and you can, you can shorten the seven or eight year payback period to about four years, that's one way. The other thing is, and I didn't see it mentioned at all in the report, although this is, you know, as I read this report, I got more and more depressed, I gotta tell you, it was not a good thing. <laughs> uh, but I, it, there was no mention of manufactured housing. Mm -hmm. And in places like uh, Germany and in China, there are building systems where they're putting up buildings in months. You know, being, they're building these, 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 uh, these floors in factories and then transporting them. To, so the point is, there are mechanisms to achieve some, some, some uh, uh, both you know, energy costs and also some efficiencies in putting up structures that could be very, I think, helpful in putting up apartment buildings you know, for uh, you know, lower income people. Mm -hmm. um, I, for you, Chris, I, I wanna come back to a point that Ellen was making about how you know, the affordable housing is the housing that we've already built. You know, it's, it's not just thinking about how to build new housing, but, you know, supply that sometimes has, has been in existence for 40, 50, 60 years or so. And, you know, one of the things that ideally we would like to think happens when Toby builds new market rate luxury housing is that, you know, may, maybe some some high income DC professionals who had been living in old housing stock move into Toby's building, you know, the the competition and the demand for, you know, this old row house that was a group home, you know, now opens up. Now perhaps that housing becomes slightly more affordable and then in a sense there's this this filtering effect. 
Uh, but, but one of the things that, that is revealed in this report is that the filtering effect is not helping people further down the way that we think it should. It, it, not enough, I think, is the answer. You know, what we find is we looked at um, filtering does happen. There is, is absolutely the, that process at work, and I think that you know, construction is always going to be expensive. You know, absent subsidies when we build housing, new housing is going to be at the upper end of the distribution. We can probably build more modern income housing than we're building now, and we probably will once Toby's filled the last of his luxury units and, and there's, you know, there's incentive to start moving down as well. Um, but filtering definitely happens. I think what we're finding now, a couple things. One is that when you have as broad an increase in demand as we're having, there's increasing demand at every point of the spectrum, and there's, there's going to be less downward filtering and probably more upward filtering, particularly in these gentrifying areas and inner city neighborhoods. So, we, there's still a, there's going to be a need to add a lot of housing, and the more we can add at different points of the rent distribution, the better. Um, the other factor is that, again, I mentioned this earlier, but if you're in that lower rent spectrum, the amount of rent you're getting is not enough to keep investing in that housing and keep it in the stock. So mm -hmm. as much what we found was there was the rate of filtering downward was just offset by the rate at which those lowest cost units were leaving the stock. Mm -hmm. And so if we can could, we could preserve some of that existing housing um, and have it for not falling out, then we'll find that the filtering effect mm -hmm. uh, would have more of an impact. Part, part of preserving that existing housing, and, and this is a minority, a very small minority of the housing market, but, but part of it is keeping it affordable as opposed to redeveloping it and upgrading it mm -hmm. into nicer housing. And I know that Chicago in particular has, has dealt with this, you know, SROs, historic buildings that were SROs that are being redeveloped as, you know, kind of chic vintage micro units. Uh, Paul, are, are, you, are you very worried about um, losing affordable housing, not just because it drops out of the end of the market and, and you know, needs to be demolished, it's deteriorated so badly, but also because you know, in, in some communities there's this kind of weird phenomenon where that housing gets upgraded? Uh yeah, and there's a lot of that happen, happening, perhaps more than filtering, there is, you know, housing that was once, you know, at least working class, you know, getting sort of gentrified. Uh, you know, f for our business in affordable housing, uh, you know, the great challenge is getting financing sometimes from five or six different sources over three right. years and building the damn thing and then renting it up. Renting it up is rarely the problem. The other longer term problem is that over the next 40 years, you need to rebuild this thing. You got to get a new roof, a new board, I mean, new windows. So you're really rebuilding it with regulated rents on the other side. So you have people who are occupying this, this property, they can't afford to pay, you know, higher rents as you sort of face, you know, and if you have an energy, energy crisis and your energy costs go up, that's, that's yet another problem. So in Chicago, it's, it's certainly, you know, I mean, we have affordable housing that was built in, you know, in the 70s in Lincoln Park, and the property is worth four or five times what it cost to build back then, and certainly, the developer that has equity partners has a fiduciary responsibility to go where the gold is, and you know, and then you know that's what happens. And there's, it's less so in some working class communities, but it's it's, an, it's a certainly ongoing challenge. I think what we should do is pass a law that only nonprofits can build affordable housing. <laughs> Everybody, raise their hand. <laughs> no. uh, this has been thoroughly depressing up to this point. So let's let's talk some more about uh, about solutions. Uh, and maybe even solutions that are hypothetically unbound by the political reality that we live in. Um, you know, one of the ones that we often talk about is inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. And Toby, you are, th this isn't a theoretical idea to you, you know, you're operating in markets that are requiring you to do that. Yes. Uh, does, does it make financial sense to you? Are people asking, are cities asking more of you than is feasible to actually do when you're working out the economics of a project? Like, how, how does inclusionary zoning actually sort of work for you and fit into what, what you guys are doing when you're trying to make a project pencil out? Sure, Here, here's the part where all my market rate buddies get mad at me, <laughs> but all of you like me, right? So I'm, I'm balancing. Um, my personal opinion, and, and hopefully by extension that of my company, is that we are more than happy to provide inclusionary zoning in our projects. It's, it's ethically fulfilling. It's not the end of the world. Montgomery County is an example, which is a large county here with tremendous affluence, requires 12.5% of all new uh, apartment units be affordable housing, and then, of course, their variance depending on the county that you go to. 
in exchange, each county in their own ways offers offsets. So for example, maybe I got extra density um, or tax breaks or whatever the case may be. But to me, it's just part of the ingredient of building a building. It's part of what you do and it's the right thing to do. I am really torn because when I heard Ellen say, and I've heard my father Tom say the same thing, that all existing affordable, affordable housing is existing that we need. For example, in Baltimore City, there are 40,000 vacant townhomes. The part where I'm torn is most of those are in really bad neighborhoods. And even if we fixed them and maybe made them okay, it's still a concentration of poverty. What's the, the, where the blessing comes in on the inclusionary side is it's just that, that word is great, inclusionary. It allows people of different income strata to be a part to live in Montgomery County, which, oh, by the way, is where they work. So why should a mailman have to drive an hour and a half or a policeman? or teacher, why is that appropriate or acceptable? Uh, so I'm actually all for it. Do you have a sense of what the, the best reasonable number is? I mean, you mentioned 12.5 in Montgomery County. Uh, in Washington, I think it's usually 10%. Uh, Bill de Blasio in New York is talking about 30%. Uh, obviously, yeah. every building is different, whether we're talking about a 100-unit building or you know a, a giant tower in New York. but is there there must be a point at which you know we we can't ask for more than what a developer can allow before their project isn't profitable anymore well in theory is as long as the offset is equal to that that you're gaining in other words you you can't impact someone's pro forma so much that the very investment becomes infeasible so that becomes the tail wagging the dog it's mm -hmm. unintentional perhaps you don't want to kill the whole project in an effort to get affordable units within that project. So I think the balance is, there, there's probably no right answer. Maybe in New York City, getting three extra units of density would pay for the whole damn thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in Montgomery County, 12.5 seems to be this magical number that who knows who made up. Um, but as long as the, the, the subsidy evens out with, so that, so that there's no net impact to the pro forma, or if there is an impact, it's de minimis enough that you can say, hey, it's no different than perhaps paying a f an off-site fee. Um, I should also point out, I'm not a big fan of paying off-site mm -hmm. fees for inclusionary zoning, because I don't get that. It's, hey, can I pay my way out of this problem? And the answer is most developers can, right? Because they're using 75% of the bank's money, 80% mm -hmm. of the bank's money. Um, I don't under, even remotely understand how that's appropriate to pay for an offsite. It just doesn't so, make sense to me. So for, uh, I want to make sure that Toby knows I agree with him, not his father. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, I, that I believe the inclusionary piece is really important and the um, ability for people of all incomes to um, live together in the same place um, is really important for, for a huge number of reasons. Um, I, I do think it's important, particularly as we sit here in Washington, where I was reflecting the other day, how nice it is that we have wide streets and low buildings because the sun comes in and everything, that if we took the height limit off, there could probably be a huge jump up in the, um, in, in the percentage that could continue to pencil out um, uh, in a building. If, if Toby can build to you know, 40 stories instead of 10, you can put in a lot more affordable units. I'm not necessarily recommending that, but I am saying that um, it's important, it, it really is important to understand the interactions of all of this. Um, conversely, if we decide for um, greenhouse gas reasons or other reasons that we're um, going to only require one parking spot per unit instead of two parking spots, for all buildings, then to some extent we've taken away a potential incentive for affordable buildings. So I mean, it, it all it all um, it all uh, melds together. I also think that a, a very special case of inclusion that we've absolutely got to pay attention to is transit-oriented development. Um, Building on top of a transit stop is um, a hugely beneficial 
um, uh, thing in terms of both the developer and in term and the potential um, tenants and uh, all too often um, the transit stops uh, are if not in they're surrounded by older affordable housing and um, Arlington County in particular has done a nice job of, of uh, thinking through that but I think the rest of us have to also um, really pay attention to not um, to not excluding from transit the very people who are a most likely to use it and be uh, most in need of it. Um, this also, to some extent, um, goes to a slightly different issue about the the drive till you can afford uh, phenomenon. To the extent we put transit in, um, whether it's, and it doesn't have to be, you know, heavy rail, it can be light rail, it can be uh, uh, restricted buses, uh, there are a whole bunch of opportunities, but to the extent that we make it easier for people uh, to actually get to where they work, um, you can't, you, you, you open up more opportunities for housing affordability. Mm -hmm. Let me, just to speak a little bit in defense of payments in lieu of units in a building. I was just going to do that, but you go ahead. Okay. Um, now, I, I'm all for inclusion, and I think that, that having affordable housing in good neighborhoods, whether they're working class or, or, or high opportunity, Paul, however we define that, I mean, it's important. And I still think there's a reason why having those units included and make sure we have more income mixing. As a society, we're getting to be more income segregated all the time, and I think that has right. costs. Um, on the other hand, you know, there is this question of how we have a huge need for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And if we can get more affordable housing by not having them be in a 40-story luxury tower, um, then maybe that's a trade-off that's worth doing. In Boston, where we have a program like that, I was just reading about a development in Chinatown where the payments came from a development around the corner in a, in a luxury apartment building, and they used that money to build a 75-unit senior citizen mm -hmm. complex. So and sometimes you might have a need for different kind of housing, family housing, senior housing, and as long as it's done, I think, thoughtfully with an idea of saying we're not using this to build more housing in, in really poor neighborhoods and, keep, and continuing this economic segregation, having that fund that a city can have to meet different needs in different places can be valuable. And we don't have to have, you know, in, in you know, places like Cambridge, I think, that they make sure that those inclusionary units are indistinguishable from every other unit. So now you're going to have, you know, somebody winning the lottery to get in a great, beautiful apartment with granite countertops mm -hmm. and all that, when maybe you could have two families who are you know, stably housed, even in the same neighborhood, but not with that same degree of luxury. So um, I think there's reasons why there's, there's trade-offs that we should be aware of. Those. What I would add to that is an element of, you know, I mean, the word inclusion, uh, you know, is a word that I think connotes uh, ac acceptability and all of that. And I think everybody here has, has read the articles about the poor door in mm -hmm. New York you know, these apartment buildings where the poor people had to go in one lobby and they could not go in the other, you know, higher-end lobby. In that kind of situation, there are issues for children and families of self-esteem, of non-inclusion, and we need to be careful about what we think of our concepts that are, uh, you know, liberal and, and, and progressive because, you know, I, I agree. I think we, need, we, uh, we can probably maximize the use of the dollars that are spent on especially high-end buildings. There was an article in the New York Times last year, building going up, I think, on 47th, on the west side, right near the Highliner, okay? And uh, two-bedroom apartments, about 110-unit building, two-bedroom apartments, $6,000 a month. The affordable apartment was $700 a month. There may have been 10 or 12 of those, but the poor, I thought about spending that dough somewhere else. That was probably... $400,000 a unit that was being put in there, and, you know, and, and, and probably the, the NOI would justify that. But the point is, hell of a lot more affordable the units can be built somewhere else, and perhaps with people who felt more included uh, among their peers and, and uh, you know, and, and, uh, and neighbors. Yeah, I mean, I think the, these trade-offs are part of what makes this conversation so incredibly difficult, particularly when we're having it in a context of constrained resources, is that, you know, it's not just should we spend this money housing five families over here or housing, you know, two families in an inclusionary building. It's also, you know, should we spend 
this pot of money providing counseling to families to find high opportunity areas with their housing vouchers, or should we take that money to provide an extra voucher to two more families? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're policymakers have an incredibly difficult job with the amount of money that we do have because everything that you want to do comes with trade-offs that I think are incredibly difficult. Um, one other sort of set of policy options that I want to talk a little bit about before uh, we bring people who have questions into the conversation is that, you know, we've been focusing a lot on affordability for people at the bottom of the income spectrum. But one of the things that the report points to is that there are affordability problems for people who, who would be considered middle class, even people who would be considered a little bit higher than middle class. And you know, if we have a hard time talking about you know, policy solutions and public investments and housing for the poor, I don't know how we're going to have this conversation when we're talking about you know, providing affordable housing to a family that makes $80,000 a year in San Francisco. Uh, Chris, have you, have you thought about you know, that there's a problem that needs to be solved here also by public policy involving people who are not poor? Absolutely. You know, and it's, it's, um, it's a very uh, challenging conundrum. Um, you know, all else equal, I think that we need to think about solutions all across the income spectrum, um, in part because the need is there, in part because I think it makes everyone, frankly, you know, buy into these, these programs. I mean, there's a reason why we, we have, you know, broader uh, eligibility for programs, because then it makes it uh, not just my issue, but all of our issues. Uh, that said, in the, and as you said, in this resource-constrained world we're in, if you're saying that we're going to you know, not be able to help these families who are struggling to put food on the table to help a family making $80,000 a year, um, it's hard to justify that to some degree. I think there are you know, broader societal issues, though, that we also have to factor in. And, you know, this question about whether or not we're going to have communities that are so balkanized, you know, the poorest households and the upper income households, I mean, places like New York and Boston are, are wrestling with this and say we don't, want to, we don't want to haul out the middle class because it, it does affect the, the both in the nature of our communities and the health of our communities. So, um, you know, I think when you put that all together, I think there is a justification for trying to uh, help people along a spectrum. And it should be that those subsidies are more shallow. If you're helping somebody making $80,000 a year, it's not going to be as deep a subsidy. So um, I think we have to start by saying, how do we expand the resources we're devoting to this problem? And with that, it becomes easier to say, let's help a broader set of folks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I do think this is the place where um, we get to talk about homeownership, too, because um, it may be that the subsidy that the $80,000 person needs is um, some really solid financial counseling and some help in saving and some um, assistance in improving your credit score and doing a bunch of things that um, can enable you to move into home ownership in, uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems that you get when rents um, in places that have uh, jobs are um, trending so incredibly high is it gets harder and harder to save for a down payment. And so you sort of stop up the whole system and uh, push the rents higher for everybody, and you know, and, and that that's a serious problem. But I but I do think we ought to we ought to remember that um, you know eighty thousand dollars is one hundred and thirty percent of area median income of, of the median income um, of uh, on, on the national level, and that at that level people you know are potential homeowners, and the question. Uh, and we ought to be thinking about, instead of thinking about how to subsidize them in rental forever, mm -hmm. um, whether there are short-term um, uh, or, or significantly less expensive short-term ways of m helping them move into sustainable home ownership. One of the other questions that, that you posed, Ellen, when we were talking about mm -hmm. this before the panel uh, that, that I want to broach is, what about rent control? <laughs> Gosh, that came back to haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> you have no one to blame but yourself. Did you float that as a question I should direct at someone else? Uh, you know, um, I mean, I think it would be fascinating to hear both Toby and Paul on, on the subject. Um, we we uh, to deflect that question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we were having a conversation at another one of these sessions that, that Chris and I were, bo were both at um, uh, 
last week, and um, you know the the uh, if 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 one of the reasons people move into home ownership is for stability, are there alternative ways of providing stability for those who? Um, don't want to own a home, who live in portions of the country like Manhattan, where, frankly, you know, not a whole hell of a lot of people, even rich people, own their own homes. Um, and, and so then the question, so I, I raised this, and Chris said, but we don't have um, a tenure uh, system in this country that, that, that allows you to be a renter with stability. Mm -hmm. To which I responded, yes, we've got New York. And um, it is, it, it, to some extent, rent control, but it's also things like Mitchell Lama and other, other kinds of, of structures uh, where you have, um, you have rent and you have, you have um, stability. And so I think that there may be a place for it. The problem is, in fact, I think there is a place for it. I think the, the problem is how you balance that off with making sure that, um, the, that um, making, making sure that there's enough money in the system so that the properties are kept up. And um, so it's of interest to the landlord to, um, continue to own and, and maintain the building without doing what is frequently done in the District of Columbia, which is to sort of figure out all kinds of ways to get around um, the laws that we do have. Um, so I'm, you know, if, if we can figure out some way to get stability into rent as a tenure, um, and if rent control is part of that, I think, I think there are certainly places in the country where it's worth doing. Everyone tweet that Ellen said that. <laughs> Put her on the record. So I'm, I'm going to ask just one more thing. Uh, but, but while I do that, please think about if you have questions. Uh, we have two microphones that you can come up to. Uh, if people are watching online, uh, we would love to take questions on Twitter also with our hashtag rental housing. Um, but anyway, while, while you all think of all of your questions, uh, the, the last thing I wanted to ask was, uh, was a political question. And you know, that's that we're, we're having these intense conversations at the local level about affordable housing, about rental housing. You know, this, is, this feels like a huge issue in Washington. San Francisco just had an election mm -hmm. where half of the topics that were on ballot measures that people were voting on had somehow to do with housing, rental housing. You know, what's happening with inclusionary zoning in New York. I mean, these, this is such an incredibly important and deeply felt topic to people at the local level, which is to say that while we're having those conversations at the national level in the presidential election that we're having, people are not talking about the things that we're talking about right here. And, uh, and I don't know why that is. Chris, do you know why that is? <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a bit of a puzzle to me as well. I think it's a couple things. One is, um, I think for a long time, there's been a sense that it's been a problem of the lowest income uh, segment of society, which is the most politically disenfranchised. And so I think part of it is that this recognition that it isn't just a problem for the poorest of the poor, but it's more of a problem for uh, the middle class as well. Um, but then the question is, is do you recognize it as an issue that the government should address? And it may well be that that turns our attention back to state and local issues because that's where we see it happening. And in truth, it is where there's a lot of the, the you know, what we were talking about earlier with Toby in terms of the development mm -hmm. process, land use regulation. So in many respects, it is a local issue as well. Um, so I think it's partly, you know, who's it affecting, how, how enfranchised they are, um, and then it's a question of where do we see the levels of power. I do think that there's also a problem, and this is something that the housing community has to address, is that there's a lack of distrust in terms of how effective our housing programs are. Paul mentioned that you know, Section 8 had a certain you know, uh, image in the public eye. And I think there's a ways in which we see housing programs as handouts and not hand-ups. And I think that we have to be open to the ways in which we should reform the tools we have to be able to make them more effective and address some of those concerns as well. So I, I think it's all those factors. Paul, what would you like to hear them talking about in, in this campaign that we're having? 
Well, you know, I, I think for the last 16 years, since 9-11, America has been uh, engulfed in, in a state of a defensive mentality. Uh, we are threatened. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that, that when you're threatened, it becomes very personal, and a lot of things uh, have lower priorities. Certainly, this is very different from what the Kerner Commission recommended 48, almost, almost uh, uh, you know, half a century ago, you know, having two societies separate and unequal, one black, one white, and drifting apart. Now we have two societies separate and unequal, but they're rich and poorer. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're experiencing the same thing. It's just economic now. The fact of the matter is, you know, that, for example, you know, how, how wars are fought. So during the First and Second World War, you know, we, we had armies on both sides. We captured cities. We, we took land. In Vietnam, we had guerrilla warfare. You know, there were huge armies that came together, firefights, and then we counted bodies afterwards. Whoever had the most bodies won. Two days later, there was nobody in the battlefield. Now we have a war where maybe you have 10 or 15,000 ISIS, you know, uh, mil mil militia in, in, in the field in, in Iraq and, and in Syria. But even if we destroyed them, the actual f battle line, the front, is in um, every American and European city. We're all in the front lines now. And that, I think, is in our minds and something that we have to deal with. Certainly, Congress is in all of that. So we, we, for, I think, 16 years, have been distracted from our cities, from our people, from our future prosperity and how we can take this enormous wealth that we still have in this country and direct it towards making people's lives better. Did that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, it, it, it made me think, too, that the, the issues that we've been talking about, I think, are, are very clearly connected to some of the themes of the election, not, not ISIS and, you know, defense, but, but social mobility, inequality, uh, in, in ways that either the candidates are, are not sort of publicly connecting or talking about. But we should be talking about the fact that, you know, if, if a, if a low-income person can't move to San Francisco where their job prospects are a lot better because they can't afford to live there, that is a problem of, of income mobility, of social mobility, of inequality. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it would, make, it would make all the sense in the world to be talking about these issues in that context. I just wanted to add one point. It, it, this did enter the presidential dialogue. About a day ago or two days ago, uh, Bernie Sanders and went to Baltimore, where I live. Um, and he visited the neighborhoods, Sandtown, Winchester, where Freddie mm -hmm. Gray died. It took that to happen. Like the walls had to be shaken, you know, by the mm -hmm. community for anyone to wake up. And then you only had one politician. I can't even imagine what Donald Trump's doing at the same time somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it, it took someone on perhaps the social extreme to, to come and acknowledge it. But I think something like this report begins to open up people's eyes. You asked me earlier, you said, how are you feeling? And I said, I'm optimistic about my business and pessimistic about humanity. I don't mean just totally to put a damper on it, but <laughs> this, um, we have to, th this report really illuminated the haves and the haves not, have not. So it's as simple as that or as complicated as that. Um, well, we have about 10 minutes left. If anyone has any questions, um, we would love to bring more people into the conversation. There, yeah, could you come up to the a microphone? microphone? Right here and there. If anybody has a question, just queue up there so we can hear you. Yeah, and if, please just uh, let us know who you are. Is the, is the microphone on? It's just meant for someone my size. I'm not a techie, so someone else should. Is it? micro? Is that microphone working over here, Heidi? This one yeah. is working. Please do. Sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Once again, I'm Jim Vitarello. I'm a housing specialist at uh, GAO and really enjoyed your talk. And we're looking at rental housing now at GAO. We're actually going to be having a, 
internal uh, policy conference uh, in February for two days where we'll be looking at rental housing and talk about a lot of these issues, particularly things like high opportunity areas and high poverty areas, et cetera. And one thing that's come up in our research is the whole phenomena of mixed income housing, particularly like this, Toby, but the others can comment on this. I'm not saying it's the panacea, but it seems that um, there, there are groups in this country who've been pushing that as a way of making it easier to um, locate, quote unquote, affordable housing, let's say in high opportunity neighborhoods, where there's a lot of nimbyism if it's 100% low income, but probably a lot less so if it's, let's say, 30% to say very low income and maybe another 30% um, moderate uh, income and then the rest, you know, market rate, et cetera. So I asked Toby particularly, is, is that something that you think could work, particularly given the right, um, uh, you know, financing and, um, and other kinds of uh, incentives, particularly in the tax credit program? I was struck by the fact that one professor sent me an email saying, Jim, 96% of the tax credit units are uh, tax credit eligible units, right? only 4% are market rate, right? and that's, a, that's for the 4% credits as well as the 9% credits. He said they're very difficult to um, uh, incentivize developers to build uh, mixed income housing right now because of, of these sort of perverse in incentives. Could you kind of comment on, on all of that and, and like for example, how could the tax credit program be made to encourage more mixed income housing? Um, Jim, thank you for your question. We, we, we do um, encourage and enjoy building mixed income housing. It, it's no different than the inclusionary zoning that we were talking yeah. about before. Our, our simple thesis is that those people that are disenfranchised and living in a poor neighborhood are always going to stay, or most likely going to stay in that strata. Um, of violence or despair, whatever the case may be, and put in a different environment, lo and behold, children raised in that environment, you used the word, Chris, earlier, health. You know, you have a healthier environment to raise our family. So I very much believe that mixed income housing is appropriate. Ironically, it is more difficult to finance mixed use housing because those people interested in uh, market rate finance are on one side of the table, and those on the affordable side are on the other. And when you try to combine the two, there's a lot of dialogue as if each one wouldn't prefer that the other was even involved. So I don't have the solutions other, other than to say that I'm encouraged. We've been able to do a few of these, and I think it's the right thing to do. Just real quickly too, Jim, I think that you know, the tax credit program, there's proposals on the table to allow for income averaging. Mm -hmm. um, so right now you get the tax credit if you are, the units are either below uh, affordable at below 60% or 50% of AMI. So there's a real incentive to have units be affordable at that level. Um, if you say instead, well, what, what if you average a certain level, and then we can build housing that you know, is affordable for somebody at 80% of AMI as well as 30. I mean, the real challenge of the tax credit program is this, it's a shallow subsidy by itself doesn't make housing affordable for people at 30. So if you allow that income averaging, you get a broader range of households as well as be able to serve people at a lower income level. What I would add to that is that you know, many of our developments are developments, family developments, where people have stayed a long time, 15, 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. And you know, no family is economically static. People are moving on up the economic structure. People who were making $35,000, dollars you know, 10 years before are now making seventy dollars or $80,000. And those people you know, like to stay in our developments. They're an example of the art of the possible for many other families. Now, in, you know, to a certain extent, regulations almost require that we get them out, but we want them to stay in. In a sense, having housing that has a broad range of, 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 of rental uh, opportunities is important for that process of economic uh, mobility. Yeah, right. But the incentives in almost all these programs are against them. That's the uh -huh. yeah. big thing. Jim, you know, you're, not, you're, you're not Mike, so we can't hear you. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but great. daycare but, is a very important part of that, by the way. Families yeah. need to have somebody take care of their kids yeah. if they're going to work. Maybe yeah. Time for another great. Thank you. My name's David Lipsetz. I work in the Rural Housing Service at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, fantastic panel. <clears throat> Thank you very much for doing it. Appreciate it. Um, with uh, the nation's largest uh, means-tested home ownership program at USDA, one of the largest rental programs. Mm -hmm. um, we look to this report to uh, inform our policy making uh, in a different geography than maybe what was included in today's conversation or 
frankly, in the report. Um, what do you know about what informs a rural geography, the housing markets there, demands and incentives to be able to uh, provide affordable housing and rental housing? Jobs. Um, uh, so um, this is a, to some extent an N equals one, but I spend a good, t good deal of time um, in Maine. And um, our, the, the, I mean, the issues that we face in terms of housing, um, there are um, jobs and opportunities. Um, the uh, mismatch with an, old, with, a, with an older population of being in houses that um, are too big, too drafty, too expensive to, to um, operate and too far away from amenities. And then with respect to the subsidized housing, the, rural, the RHS housing, um, it's a little bit like the problem that I raised with the respect to the urban two to fours, which is you have older landlords who um, are um, less able to keep those things going and how you um, uh, uh, transition them to, um, to stay in the affordable housing stock while simultaneously um, being physically in, you know, uh, improved is, is very difficult. Um, but <laughs> I really do think the jobs issue is, is number one. Just real briefly, just uh, I do uh, apologize that we didn't have as much emphasis or enough emphasis on rural housing in the report. I think it is an important issue and one that, as looking back on it, we didn't cover as much as we could have. Um, I think there are you know, particular issues in rural areas. Certainly, uh, incomes are lowered. The jobs question is an important one. And then there's a question of scale. When you think about a lot of our assisted housing programs, the complexity that we've talked about yeah. drives you to uh, have bigger scale to spread that complexity over more units, harder to do in rural areas. And so in some sense, I think we need to think about simpler programs, too, that will work on a smaller scale in more places. So we have one more question coming up. Hi, Sheila Crowley, National Long Income Housing Coalition. Uh, I have a question for you, Emily. Um, so you are this rare person in the media who is known to cover housing issues. Um, that's why we're all inviting you to come to our events. Um, so why is it that you, what is it that inspired you to do that? And why, how can we uh, help others of your ilk take on this, um, this question? Our impression in the housing world is that we get short shrift in, uh, in the media um, and that uh, it's not, doesn't, doesn't get as much exposure as other social issues, even though we think we are as important. Right. Um, well, that enables me to say the last word also, since the last <laughs> question was directed at me and we're almost running out of time. Um, I mean, I, I think that that's a fair criticism of the media, that housing issues sort of get short shrift. Um, you know, when, when I think about, you know, the, the various agencies in Washington and what you cover, you know, the person who keeps an eye on HUD is, is not the person who winds up on the front page on a regular basis relative to a lot of other things that are in the news. But, but one thing that I would say is that, you know, to, to me, these issues feel like they are growing more and more important, and it is easier and easier for me to make the case for why the things that we're talking about are a big deal, you know, because people all up and down the income spectrum are sort of feeling the pinch of, of what their rent costs them. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy for me right now to write stories about, you know, how your rent is too damn high because that's something that resonates with a lot of people. Uh, but, but housing is also, you know, very central to a lot of other issues that are in the news. You know, what happened in Ferguson and Baltimore is partly about housing. You know, questions about inequality and racial segregation are questions about housing. Um, you know, Raj Chetty's work about social mobility and uh, creating economic opportunity for poor kids, you know, a lot of that has to do with housing too. So uh, I, I guess I would say, you know, very briefly in sum that, you know, yes, I agree with you. 
Uh, but I also think it's getting easier to make the case for why we should talk about housing. And if you are really interested in this also, you know, just as I'm suggesting we should be doing with the presidential candidates, we should be pointing out, you know, why housing is connected to all of these other things that people don't think housing has anything to do with. Um, but anyway, on that note, we have... Well, let me just add, so yeah. Sheila said the reason we invite you to do this is because you're one of the rare people talking about housing. But I think we also invite you to do this because you're really fabulous at this. You have a really good grasp of the issues. You ask great questions. And so just on behalf of the Joint Center, thank you not only for your work, but thank you for being with us here today. That was, it was terrific. Well, thank you. And thank you. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists. And uh, thank you for hosting this great event. All right. Good meeting you.